I'm back with our Gigabyte R181 dual Xeon server again. Just a massive amount of memory, dual redundant power supplies, only one U. You might think that that means that it's got limited expansion capability, but that's not really true. This actually makes a really great platform for software defined storage solutions. Strictly speaking, software defined storage, that's a marketing buzzword. It doesn't really mean anything by itself. Then I get to thinking about RAID and the different disk configurations that are available on the chassis. And I thought we could talk for a second about software defined storage and what that means for RAID arrays and why RAID controllers are generally an older, obsolete technology now. Not really a lot to it. So if you look at our chassis here, we get two CPU sockets. So a lot of CPU horsepower with the dual 28 core processors and, and we get a ton of room for memory expansion and the front panel is configured with 10 two and a half inch drive bays. It's configured for SATA right now, but you could just as easily be serial attached SCSI for high end, you know, SSDs. Serial attached SCSI is a little bit less, a little bit yesteryear, but also uh, offers some more advanced features than SATA. There's also an NVMe front, so if you want to have two and a half inch NVMe drives, not a problem. You can do that. It's a different chassis configuration. Those OCP slots at the at the back, they're low profile and high bandwidth for things like you know 2,500 gig network connections. They, they won't get in the way any of your regular PCIe expansion. So you can use those for external like, interface cards, for or for NVMe, or if we want to connect a lot of old slow spinning rust, we can do it. But we can also mix new, fast, modern storage, like NVMe and NVMe storage and flash, just solid state storage, even though it's only a 1U chassis. So I talked a little bit about RAID. The way that you should think about a RAID controller is that it's a computer on a card, and it's, yeah, it turtles all the way down. On a RAID card, you take a bunch of mechanical or SSD disks, or maybe, you know, some of them will let you mix SSDs and mechanical disks, and use the SSD for caching and like the LSI cache cade. Some other cards call it something else, but it uses a little bit of flash memory to uh, cache the storage. Could be SAS, could be SATA. There are a few that do support NVMe, but maybe even spinning rust. And it tries to do everything sort of with one piece of hardware. It takes that piece of hardware, that amalgamation, and presents it to the host server like as if it's one piece of storage. This is how a RAID card traditionally has been. The problem with that is that the scalability is kind of limited. You can only sort of scale it within this one chassis. Maybe an external chassis or two for disks, but failover and redundancy isn't that great. If you imagine a hypothetical scenario where I've got two of these one U servers and they're managing my storage array, it actually gets really complicated to handle that at a hardware level with a hardware RAID controller because each one of these needs a physical piece of hardware that connects to both sets of disks and they need to do a lot of intricate communication. There are ways to do that, but most all of them don't involve physical PCIe cards running inside the machine that are physically attached. For that, we need to get it a little bit more complicated on the software side of things to sort of manage the complexity. And that's the software and software-defined storage. Let's take a look at the level one storage array, which uses ZFS and also Flash. Oh, and we'll, we'll bring this with us. So here we are, the old, the old yellow, old yeller, the uh, Google server. This is currently the main front end for Level 1's main storage server. 172 terabytes of raw capacity, but we physically split the array. One group of hard drives is the data here, it's all our videos and everything else. And then there's another replica off-site. It's really a pretty mundane pedestrian setup, really. The ZFS is not really particularly magical here. ZFS is a file system but it really combines device management and volume management and a file system all together. So I've got a ton of mechanical hard drives here, but there are also two and a half inch drives and PCI Express flash storage. ZFS historically uh, doesn't do the best combining high speed devices and low speed devices. They are working on that and that is gonna be a thing, but you know, you can have a high speed ZFS pool and a lower speed mechanical ZFS pool and that's the thing. So I want to talk about this kind of in the context of Linux's LVM. So with LVM, it's a piece of software on Linux. Let's say that I add my shelves of, of hard drives here, uh, 48 mechanical hard drives in this case, although there are you know, rack mount cases like this that 
are two uh, two drives deep to a sled. So when you pull one of these out, you get two hard drives, not just one. So it'd be you know 96 hard drives instead of 48. With LVM, it's a piece of software. So these drives would, would present to the server individually. If you ask a server operating system historically, like Windows, hey, manage all of these hard drives. It's really not going to do a job. It's not super optimized for that. You, you think hardware RAID controller. These actually are NetApp shelves. This is older technology, but the NetApp shelves were exactly that. They were built to be a uh, network attached storage or fiber channel attached storage. And it was really just computers. It wasn't a hardware RAID controller. It wasn't a computer on a small card. It was full rack servers just like this. And that's why I can use these is because they were so well designed uh, that I can still use these, you know, even 10 years later and still get a lot of mileage out of it. I can even mix in this brand new Gigabyte R181 server, which has got, you know, dual Xeon Gold, 6280s, and 768 gigabytes of memory with this older technology. This is my slow storage tier. And because the software has advanced, the hardware is still valuable because it's still useful because it is just a software construct. So back to LVM. What LVM does is it lets you just add hard drives to a pool. So if I were using LVM with this instead of ZFS, I would, I would be able to just tell LVM, hey, I've got 48 hard drives here for you, just add them to the pool. Now in LVM, I can create volumes. And this is a little different than partitions. You may be familiar with like partitioning a hard drive, taking one hard drive and slicing it up. It's just like a pie. It's a little destructive when you do that kind of a partition, you know, sort of in a, in a traditional vernacular when you're talking about partitions. Say two thirds of the disk is one partition, a third of the disk is another partition, and there might be like, you know, just a few hundred megabytes or a gigabyte for the third partition. But you've sort of set in stone how that disk is going to be used from now until the end of time. Well, with a volume manager, you just add all of the disks to be managed by the volume manager. And then at volume creation time, you can specify some things. At volume creation time, you can say, hey, I want you to pre-allocate a certain number of terabytes. Or you can say, hey, I want to uh, make sure that the performance is always this in terms of I.O. counters or anything like that. Or you can say, I want this level of redundancy. That was something recently added to LVM on Linux. And so it's like, wait a minute, redundancy? Yeah, think about a traditional RAID controller. I'm going to create a RAID 5 array or a RAID 6 array. Or I might have you know, a RAID 1 on the controller of some of the drives and a RAID 5 for some of the other drives. A RAID 1 is just a mirror. It's the easiest thing. And RAID 5 is like, you know, you have one drive's capacity worth of redundancy. But uh, that's, that's about it in terms of redundancy. RAID 6 is you have two drives worth of redundancy. Not that you have one drive that only stores redundant information, just that you get one extra you know, so if you have five drives, 20% of the space is used for redundancy information, which happens to equal the capacity of one drive, but that redundancy information is spread around on all of the drives. With six drives, so you'd have two-sixths of the information in RAID 6 that's used for redundancy information, and that's spread across all of the drives. ZFS is kind of similar. You can have um, a ZFS pool made up of multiple VDEVs, and you can elect what level of uh, redundancy you want for each VDEV and then within inside the pool you can also create uh, data sets that have the properties that you want including things like compression and some of the other stuff. The VDEVs determine the level of redundancy and the data sets determine some of the access parameters so ZFS and, and LVM they don't really line up exactly the, but that's, a, that's, a, that's neither here nor there. Another really important thing to understand and keep in mind, and hopefully it's not too much from the information fire hose, is LVM is just a volume manager. You create the volume and it shows up like a block device and it has whatever redundancy you specify. So with RAID 1 and you've got a whole bunch of hard drives, you're going to have a mirror or you can have an in-way mirror, you can have a three-way mirror, a four-way mirror, a five-way mirror. With RAID 5 or RAID 6 or RAID 10, it's going to change the underlying strategy that it uses to allocate data across all of those drives. All that just gives you a block device though. You still need to create a file system, so ext2 or 3 or 4, ext4, xfs. So btrfs is kind of an attempt at bringing some of the ZFS features onto a file system that can deal with multiple hard drives. One of the quirks from that originally was, I'm going to create a btrfs volume and it's going to be RAID 1. It's like, what's my free space? It's actually twice the available free space. It is the raw free space, 
but files are twice as big as you think they are because when it writes one file, it writes another copy to another drive. The problem is that when you're doing the LVM approach where LVM is going to not care about the file system and create a block device, that it's up to LVM to manage the uh, redundancy information and the like CRCs and extra stuff like that. So it can be not quite as efficient. Whereas with something like ZFS, it's built from the ground up for redundancy. And you have, I can't believe I'm saying this, but you have less overhead with ZFS than the sum total of the overhead that you have between the file system and the volume manager and all of the other componentry. And so this enchilada is the uh, building block of the software-defined dataset. Now, I mentioned backup. ZFS has a really amazing capability built into it uh, because it journals everything. You can create a remote data set. You can create a, a, a copy of all of our ZFS stuff somewhere else. And instead of what normally happens with a traditional file system, which is it has to scan the entire file system to look for changes and sends those changes to a remote system, with ZFS, because of the way that it creates a transaction log and it tracks the transactions, ZFS doesn't have to do that. The algorithmic efficiency of that is basically 01. You know, it's a constant because everything that has been added to the transaction log from the last transaction on the remote file system is what has to be sent over the wire. So ZFS can just look at its transaction log history, look at the blocks that have changed, and just linearly go through the list of data that has to be sent to a remote file system. This is really awesome. But this is not something that happens at a file system level or even a piece of hardware level. There's actually cron jobs and things like that involved. So there's a software layer that happens in user space. And no matter what kind of software defined storage system you're looking at, those kind of things happen. Uh, with ZFS, I use tags on the ZFS dataset to determine how backed up it is. So things like our template projects and some of our really important stuff will actually even get another extra copy and it's basically immutable. So like if somebody tries to accidentally delete it, ZFS is like, okay, well I'll let you think you deleted it or I'll mark it as deleted, but I'm never actually gonna remove the data set that contains the snapshot of that information. And so with software defined storage, you can actually create a whole bunch of those arrays. You can say this is SQL uh, databases, this is the, we need this level of redundancy, we need this many offsite backups, we need to store this many backups in cold storage. And because those properties of the data set in which you store the data uh, have those tags, then you don't have to worry about explicitly managing that. And in an environment where you have a lot of virtual machines, for example, and a modern NetApp system or a modern VMware system, software-defined storage means that you store your VM you know, wherever it needs to be. It's like maybe we've got a, a pool of terminal servers and they're all generated by script. So the data set that those are stored in doesn't even need to be backed up because they can be generated at a moment's notice from our installation script and added to our remote desktop or our Horizon client storage pool or whatever it is. We really don't need a lot of redundancy. Things like vSAN and you know all the different vendors special sauce can, can enter the foray there. So that's what I mean when I say software defined storage is a little bit of a marketing term. For us on ZFS on the open source world, it's a little more transparent because I just create a script. It's like, here's my backup, here's my thing that's running. Here's how it's gonna do its thing. With LVM and CentOS and Linux, you can configure the same kind of thing with rsync and backups and the stuff that the volume manager supports, things that the file system supports, things that your vendor level software supports. Maybe things like, you know, you can't make a copy, you can't make a clean copy of things like MySQL databases, so you have to hook into MySQL and set up replication, but depending on what you do with your VM and how you've got your deployment script set up, you may be able to automate those kinds of things. And just by virtue of this machine being this class of machine or having this tag or ever how you've got your system set up, those things happen automatically so that an administrator doesn't have to worry about it. You as super administrator can give your junior administrators something in another office, access in another office, and just by virtue of their machines being tagged a certain way or in a certain organizational unit or running in a certain VMware cluster or whatever your vendor specific stuff is just by virtue of it being in the right place you get all this wonderful checklist of all the stuff that's going to happen with the data on that system. Microsoft even has another different product in System Center just for managing the data and continuity because it's another way to build people, right? But really it's just data assurance. That's all it is. And so I'm really looking forward to getting this one new server set up from Gigabyte to replace our aging Google server. It's got a little bit more horsepower. You may think that doing all of this in software, doing all of this with the CPU, 
has a lot of overhead and it's generally not a good thing. It's like, well, Intel in particular has virtual RAID on chip. And these are hardware extensions that basically let all of the, the RAID stuff, all of the device level stuff that's, that is physically happening with the stuff attached to the server, there's basically no real performance penalty. It eats a little bit into memory bandwidth, but usually you've got memory bandwidth to spare. But while the CPU is doing regular computation, it can also be doing VROC computation in parallel. And so the amount of performance hit that you have is actually very little. On competing platforms like AMD Epic, most of the SIMD stuff can also run kind of in parallel. It's a little bit of a power and thermals budget on the AMD side versus Intel. So depending on what your power budget is, even if you're running a lot of these RAID top calculations on spinning rust because it's so slow and because of the overhead and because the CPUs are so much faster than storage, even when you've got 48 or 96 disks attached to a single node, it's really not that much CPU overhead to manage all of the throughput in I.O. But if you were to try to do that on a PCIe card, oh, it's a nightmare. You shouldn't even bother to do that. And that's why we haven't seen NVMe RAID cards because the amount of CPU horsepower that you would need to even manage, you know, a four-way NVMe on a little PCIe card, we don't... That's not a thing. The thing is going to get hot and be unreliable and just terrible. It would be much better to manage that in the CPU. And that's why we have things like VROC. And that's why there's not really that much of a marketplace for RAID controllers that involve NVMe for anything other than a cache. And that's why... <laughs> and thus was born Software Defined Storage. And there you go. That's a fairly dense, fairly quick rundown of all the stuff that sort of gave us software defined storage and ZFS. And ZFS is really awesome. ZFS is going to be amazing when it will properly support having mixed speeds of disks. Like it actually has some stuff built in to manage uh, pools of disks that are a little bit different in speed, but it really struggles when you've got a pool of NVMe plus a pool of SATA plus a pool of mechanical hard drives. It's like, I just want one big volume and I don't want to have to think about it. ZFS doesn't do that yet. That's the promise of ZFS, but it doesn't, it doesn't do that yet. That's the promise of ZFS in general. Like, I don't want to have to think about how my data is stored at a bit level. Just make it happen and make it happen across servers. You can do that, but uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of the performance tuning and some of the memory over. There's a lot of there's a lot of things to worry about with ZFS, but there are proprietary solutions like NetApp's modern proprietary solution. It is actually very nice. It does a lot of this stuff. They've done all, billions of dollars of engineering to figure it out and it works really well. And, and it is the least horribly proprietary storage solution that's out there. I mean, Dell bought EMC and, uh, uh, let's not, I'm one of this is level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.